I love science fairs because for a lot of kids, it's their first exposure to science. And because of my background in science and this YouTube channel and the fact that I am an uncle, I've consulted on quite a few projects. So today, with some help from my superstar nephew, Ty, we're not only going to tell you our secrets on how to win, but we're going to give you 10 different science fair project ideas, most of which we've tried and not to brag, but they've won first place. So let's just get right started with the ideas and then we'll tell you some of our tips as we go along. So the first idea is how many times do you need to shuffle a deck of cards before they are sufficiently mixed up. So the idea is you arrange all the cards in order and then you have one person shuffle them and then after each shuffle, you count how many cards are still in sequential order. So you repeat this a bunch of times and then take an average of how many shuffles it takes until you feel they're sufficiently mixed up, which I would argue is really useful information to be armed with. And this brings us our first really important power tip, the project should be relatable to the kid, something they encounter in their everyday lives they actually want to test. So like kids can challenge something their parents always tell them, like does eating carrots really give you enhanced night vision? Whatever you do, do not do the science project. What effect does sunlight or no sunlight have on plant growth? First of all, three other people will already be doing that project at your science fair. And secondly, that is so Boring. What a lame first exposure to the scientific method that would be. A more exciting idea would be to test if the five second rule is really true. So you could drop a piece of food on the ground and leave it there for one second, and then drop another piece on the ground and leave it there for six seconds, and then take a culture of each and put it in a petri dish, and then compare the spore growth after a couple days. Petri dishes are like 15 bucks on Amazon, and they're a great way to measure the level of bacteria on any surface. So another project idea would be to measure measure which services in your house are the most germ infested. Okay, for our fourth idea, I remember as a kid hearing that professional soccer players would use balls filled with helium and that's why they were able to kick it so far. So you could test this by filling one ball with normal air and then one with helium and then do a bunch of kicks and see which one goes farther. But there's a slight problem with this and it introduces our second power tip. Even with the same ball, I don't kick it the same distance every single time. So we're introducing some extra uncertainty certainty and not just measuring the effect of the helium. So a better way to test this is to drop them both from a tall distance and see if one hits the ground later than the other. A good experiment is designed such that you keep everything the exact same and then you change only one thing. So in this example you drop it from the same height, ideally you'd have the same model of ball, and the only thing that's different is one is filled with helium and the other is filled with air. And then you measure one thing and you see if there's a correlation. So in this case you're measuring how long it takes to hit the ground. So our second power tip is to come up with an experiment where you keep everything the same in between trials except you change one thing and that'll allow you to measure the effect of just that one thing. One of my nephews won first place at a science fair by testing do video games really rot your brains. So you'd spend 30 minutes each day either reading, playing outside, playing with Legos, or playing video games and then he would take a short standardized intelligence test after each session. This was a really cool concept but I feel like there might be a lot of hidden variables that would affect the test. So like his mood, whether or not he got a good night's rest, what he ate that day. You really want to try and isolate only the thing you're changing in between trials. Oh, and quickly going back to timing things, if you want to time something really accurately, a stopwatch isn't great because it depends on your reaction time to hitting the buttons. A better way is to record the event in slow-mo on your phone, which records at 240 frames per second and then plays back at 30 frames per second. So you watch the video back in slow motion and count how many seconds it takes in slow-mo and then divide that by eight and that's how many seconds it took in real life. So that will give you much more precise measurements on a timed event. Moving on to number five, there's a paper written about the best strategy for winning rock, paper, scissors. I'll put the link in the description. Basically it boils down to what sign you should throw depending on what your opponent threw the round before. So you can first play a bunch of games before you learn the rules and then you can study the rules and then play a bunch of games afterwards and see if your win percentage percentage increased. Going back to our first power tip about making it relatable, you can see how that would be way more exciting for a kid than the number one result you get from Google when you search for science fair project ideas, such as how to make your own pH paper.
Like, what are you even testing there? According to Tina Selig, who teaches innovation and creativity at Stanford, science fairs are not only a great opportunity to learn science, but also to learn creativity. When people asked her, how can you learn to be more creative in a recent Reddit AMA, she said this. Creativity is applying your imagination to address a challenge. This requires both motivation and experimentation. So the best way to improve your creativity is to tap into your motivation, no matter how small it is, and begin experimenting. This can be as easy as seeing how you feel after getting different amounts of sleep, or seeing how your colleagues respond to you when you greet them in different ways. These small experiments tune up your creative problem-solving abilities. Notice she says here that the motivation is just as important as the experimentation. And since learning how to always win at rock, paper, scissors is likely more motivating for a grade schooler, it will do much more for your creativity than, say, learning how to make pH paper. I also really like that quote because when I read it, I had just gotten data back from the woman who cuts my hair about the tips she receives. As a favor to me and my curiosity, for two months, she recorded not only how much each person tipped her, but she also recorded their age, gender, cultural background, time and day of the week, and whether or not they were married. She got me data on over 230 haircut tips. I will leave a link to the spreadsheet in the description if you're interested. But one of the more fascinating findings was that Americans in general tipped almost exactly 15%. Europeans also tipped on average 15%, but there was a huge variation. So some tipped nothing, and then some tipped a bunch, suggesting that they're not super familiar with it because tipping isn't really a thing over there. Okay, number six, going back to something your parents always tell you, does practice really make perfect? So for this, you choose a skill like shooting free throws, and then practice for a set amount of time every day, and then track your progress to see how quickly you get better. But you do other things too, like putting a golf ball, or mastering a song on an instrument, or even mastering a skill in like a video game. Okay, so for idea number seven, what is the best paper airplane design? Now this brings up our third power tip. I'm posing all of these ideas as questions, but the way the scientific method actually works is you make some observations, and then based off those initial observations, you make a guess as to what you think will happen. We call that guess a hypothesis. Then you perform a bunch of tests to basically try and prove your guess wrong. And if you can't prove it wrong, no matter how hard you try, then it must be true. And we accept it as true. So for the paper airplanes, maybe your hypothesis would be that airplanes with really narrow wings fly further than those with wide wide wingspans. So you create a bunch of variations and basically try and prove that guess wrong. Just make sure you do it indoors, going back to power tip two, making sure there aren't external influences outside of your control that would affect the experiment like the wind. Idea eight is what is the best way to heat up food in your microwave? So you pick one food, like a frozen burrito, and then test a bunch of different settings and maybe locations in your microwave. To check the temperature, you could use an infrared microwave like I invented for a previous video, but failing that, a meat thermometer should be just fine. You can also use a thin layer of cheese to develop a hotspot map for your microwave by seeing which areas melt first. And incidentally, if you measure the distance between melted spots in conjunction with the frequency of your microwave, you can actually calculate the speed of light. I'll put the link below in the video description if you'd like more details on how to do that. Whatever you do, and this brings up our final power tip, make sure you can explain it in your own words. Most science fairs have an interview portion where the judges come around and talk to each of the students. They do this because it's a way to tell if the parent did all the work if the kid can't explain it well. This is another reason why picking a relatable project matters. It's easier to explain how you dominate your friends in rock, paper, scissors than it is to get pumped about a slightly withered plant in the shade. We recommend practicing the interview in front of the poster the night before by having a grown-up ask some mock interview questions. For idea 9, I made a video to test which animal people would swerve more to hit on the side of the road. So I used a rubber tarantula, snake, and turtle. Now I don't recommend you repeat this, but you can do a slightly safer version by taking these animals and hiding them on a sidewalk and then secretly watching to gauge people's reactions. The only problem with this is the thing you're measuring is a person's reaction, which is sort of hard to quantify. You really want to pick things to measure that have numbers associated with them that you can easily record. So like time, or distance, or number of wins, or spores in a petri dish, etc. And for the final idea, you know how people are always looking at babies and they tell the parents like, oh my gosh, he looks just like you. I think that's bull. As far as I can tell, babies just look like babies. They're all the same. 
The other day at work, someone saw a picture of my coworker's baby and said this. So I decided to call him on it. And I got a picture of my coworker and his wife, and then like 10 random babies. And then I passed it out to see if people could guess. So you could do this with a baby picture of you, and some other random babies, and then your parents, and then give them to people and see if people could pick out which one is you. And by the way, exactly zero people were able to guess which one his kid was. So, people are liars. So those are my 10 ideas. If you have a really good idea that you want first place with, put it in the comments below and then I'll take the best ideas and just make a growing killer list of ideas in the video description. And maybe you don't have a science fair coming up, but perhaps you can share this with someone who does and then we can replace the really lame ideas that currently come up in Google search results. For those who are just getting started with science, regardless if you use one of these ideas, or even better, come up with your own based upon the principles we talked about, the most important part is that you have fun, you experiment, you learn something, and then you dominate your competition. So I am here today with Jason, whom you know well from the most popular sketch comedy channel on YouTube, Scott Stanley! Studio C, and he's actually here because we filmed the video together on their channel. Okay, Jason, so why don't you tell us about the script you wrote? All right, so the basic premise is there's a group of uh, plane crash survivors on a deserted island, and they discover Mark is in their company. And at first, they're thinking, this is great, right? Like Mr. Invention Man himself is going to come up with all these uh, coconut devices that'll make their lives, you know, happy and carefree. Well, the inventions don't go exactly as they foresaw them, perhaps as Mark and his twisted mind. <laughs> it's not my fault, you guys don't have an appreciation. We, don't, we didn't appreciate them at the time, and maybe, you know, in 10 years we can laugh at that. And you get to see Mark in his first major acting debut, which yeah. is worth it. First and like, maybe like, last once you see it. So you be the judge, I'm gonna put a link right here. Make sure you uh, subscribe to Studio C. They have really funny stuff that's always clean and just really high quality. So check it out, and as always, thanks for watching.